for those that may not know, I, I'm Andy Agatangelo. I'm the founder of the Transparency Task Force. Uh, we operate many different groups. Uh, one of the groups is now called Fighting Financial Crime. And that is a group that's very relevant to this topic we're covering tonight, uh, pension scams. Uh, we have invested a significant amount of time and effort into this topic over the last three and a half years or so, mostly as a consequence of the real life experience of some of our uh, members who themselves have been scam victims. And believe you me, there's nothing more motivating and inspiring than listening to the way that some people in the UK have had to battle and battle and battle, try to get justice and compensation and fair treatment as a consequence of having become a scam victim. It's absolutely heartbreaking some of the stories that uh, endure over the, over the years. We have a tremendous amount of speakers tonight. I'm really pleased with how the events come together. We've got Pete Lancey, followed by Leslie Carline, followed by Margaret Snowden, then Nigel Mills MP, then Ruth Jones MP. Nigel Mills is one of the members of the Work and Pensions Select Committee. It's a great committee. It's been doing some fantastic work to help raise awareness of the issue of pension scams and more importantly, to try to uh, propose some, um, some, uh, some changes. Uh, and in, indeed, it's been very active of late in relation to the pensions bill part of which has been about pension scams. So it's great to have, uh, it's great to have Nigel with us. It's also great to have our other parliamentary uh, member today with us, um, who is basically here to spend a few minutes sharing her thoughts as well, Ruth Jones MP. Ruth is part of the all party parliamentary group on pension scams. I'm going to very quickly share my screen to show you that APPG's website. For those of you outside the UK, an all-party parliamentary group is where politicians work collaboratively to try to deal with known issues or known problems. So this is the website for the APPG on pension scams. We're very proud of this because this is an APPG that's been, uh, been initiated by TCS Work, so we're generally very proud of it. We've built the website ourselves. We're even more proud about the calibre and, frankly, the quantity of parliamentarians who responded to the call for people to work together across the house to deal with this big known problem. Um, there's quite a few, so I'll glance through this pretty quickly. Um, and we're always look, looking out for more parliamentarians. Here's Stephen Timms MP. I'll mention Stephen specifically because he's the chair of the Working Pension Select Committee. And he and his select colleagues really have uh, got the bit between their teeth uh, on this particular matter and we're so, so incredibly grateful for him and his colleagues that, that, that they are, because this is an issue that absolutely demands the attention of Parliament. Um, and there's more here. Um, great, great people all doing this on a purely voluntary basis to try to help the cause to resolve the many issues we have within the uh, pension scams problem. And here, uh, here is Ruth Jones MP, Labour Newport West, delighted that Ruth's involved with the APPG and also, of course, delighted that Ruth is with us this evening. That's fantastic. I'm going to briefly share two other pages for specific reasons. This is the Secretariat. The, the Transparency Task Force is the Secretariat for the All-Party Parliamentary Group. You'll see in the top row there, Leslie and Peter are speaking this evening. And we have many, many other members, um, including Sue Flood here, for example. It really has been Sue Flood that's got me so inspired about trying to do what I've been trying to do over the years to try to wrestle with and deal with the pension scams problem. We've got other folk here like Mark Bishop, who's with us this evening, and Kim, uh, all helping on a purely voluntary basis to do, uh, to do important work. I'll come back to Mark Ormston in a moment because Mark Ormston's responsible for our resources page. I'll talk about that shortly. So I just want to briefly say thank you to everybody that has volunteered to be part of this. Peter's with us today as well. Stephanie's with us as well today. So it's a great bunch of volunteers. Ian Beeson, I'm sure, is with us. Francisco's probably with us as well. A great bunch of volunteers who are helping out. Dean's with us, I think, as well, Steve, too, uh, to try to make a difference. And uh, we've even got a QC. Ian Mitchell QC is a very, very capable QC. 
who's helping us understand some of the finer legal nuances around um, around pension scams, et cetera, et cetera. Rich is tonight, I think Sarah is as well. So that's the secretariat. It's not too late to become a member of that secretariat if you want to volunteer to help. And the page I'm gonna very quickly show you is the page that I mentioned already is being very kindly looked after by Mark Ormston, who's been an absolute hero in terms of the work going on behind the scenes. If we go to our resources page, <clears throat> excuse me, what we basically want here is a, um, a font of all knowledge. So the idea of the resources page is that everything and anything that anybody's got that might be useful to the pension scams problem is to be put here. So that pension scam victims, members of the pensions industry, so on and so forth, it can all go here. We're probably gonna move this section, the victim support section to the top. The reason for that, as I'm sure many of you will know, um, when somebody realizes they've become a pension scam victim, it's a complete emotional shock as well as financial shock. And as a consequence, many, many, many people go through deep, deep, deep depression. And sadly, some of them never come out the other side. That's why having Samaritans, Think Jessica, Victim Support, etc., available here is so, so important. So the message, folks, is simple. If you've got anything that might be useful, if you're from any organization, a pensions company, an investment company, a consultancy, please liaise with Mark Ormston. If he hasn't already done it, Mark will kindly put his, um, his email address into the chat. Liaise with Mark, Mark's volunteered to run that page for us. And let's make that page a really, really useful uh, resource. Okay, a couple of other things I'm gonna briefly, briefly cover off. Um, in terms of the transparency task force, we have recently changed our model. Okay, and I, I am going to take this opportunity to explain that because some of you aren't yet aware of it. We have had a model in the past where we generated the revenue we need uh, through event sales, and we want to come away from that. We want to be less of an event management organization and more of a proper, proper community. And, and we are, we have 2,700 members around the world uh, all dealing with all sorts of issues. So as a consequence, we have what we now call our subscription model, and I'm going to explain it. We're very proud of it. We think the way that we have designed it really does reflect our values and our purpose. So I'm just going to briefly explain it uh, to you all now. I know that some of you have already, have already uh, decided to become subscription members, which is great. But let me just quickly share my screen share screen and I'll go to this other page. Here we go. So we'll include a link to this page in the chat later on. Basically we have two types of members. Those who are standard members who if they want to remain a standard member they can. They simply pay the VAT, sorry the 245 plus VAT per symposium. Uh, if they want to do it that way they can continue to do so. We haven't taken any options away in terms of the standard ticket price for the events. However, much more sensible than that we think is what we call our subscription model. People who become subscription members can enjoy as many TTF events as they want whilst they are a subscription member. And there are four options. Option one is 480 pounds plus VAT for the whole year for as many events as that person wants to attend that we think represents tremendous value for money. Option two, is 135 pounds plus VAT per quarter. Option three is 50 pounds plus VAT per month. Option four is very, very special. Option four is an individually agreed concessionary rate. And it is up to the individual to propose the amount. Now, the most logical thought that should immediately come to your mind is, well, okay, but what's the minimum? There isn't a minimum. Okay, I want to make this crystal clear. There is literally no minimum. So if you generally cannot afford the 480 or the 135 or the 50, um, then you simply say, I want a concessionary rate. Uh, this amount works for me. Is that okay? And whatever that amount is, you'll get a reply back saying, yes, welcome aboard as a subscription member. Please pay as much as you can afford because we are running such a tight budget, it's unbelievable. It is amazing what we are doing, given the resources that we have. That's my personal opinion. Uh, so please be as generous as you can afford to be, but I do not want price or cost or budget or resource 
to get in the way of anybody with the right kind of mindset and the right kind of sentiments actually becoming involved with TTF's work. Uh, we're on a mission. We're doing something which we believe to be both noble and necessary. It's really hard to do what we're doing because we are fighting against the current. Uh, we are taking on all sorts of challenging vested interests and we're having to stick our neck out and take some risks and be bold and be brave and do what needs to be done. But that's why we're here. If I wanted an easy option, I'd go back and do what I used to do. I'm not here for an easy option. I'm here to make a difference. And I'm truly, truly blessed to have the team of people I have. And I'm truly blessed to have 2,700 community members around the world. So please play your part in this. Become a subscription member. Choose whichever of the four options works for you. And uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, pension scams. Let's, um, let's go back to that topic. Um, we cover 20 groups. We've got groups of people covering foreign exchange. We've got other groups of people covering asset management, pensions, investments, governance. There's a really long, risk, long list of all the things that Transparency Task Force is involved with. Head and shoulders above all of them is the issue around pension scams and scamming generally, okay? Because it is causing so much harm, yeah? It is causing emotional and financial harm to so many people, not hundreds, thousands, not a few thousand, tens of thousands. Frankly, I personally consider it to be something of a national disgrace that we are where we are. Now, we're not going to beat ourselves up or each other up about the fact that we are where we are. We're just going to recognise that we are where we are and we want to stop being where we are, which means we want to find real, practical, workable solutions. And there's a great big long list. We've submitted, TTF alone has submitted, I think, over about 110 pages worth of ideas to the inquiry on pension scams. And of course, there are many other very competent, capable organizations, such as the pensions, um, uh, the pensions industry, sorry, the pension scams industry group, who are full of great ideas as well. Between all of that, there's got to be some real workable solutions. The reason we've chosen to call this event tonight is how would you solve the pension scams problem? is that we don't spend time talking about the problem. We've done that, we've been doing that for years. We know where we are with a problem. The focus is gonna be on real, practical, implementable solutions that we hope the industry, the parliamentarians will pick up with them and, and, and embrace. Because we don't wanna hang about. These issues have been around for years and years and years. Let's try to get it sorted out. Let's try to put it to bed. We had a... Um, we had a Zoom meeting last night. A bunch of us got together to discuss pension scams. And uh, Brian McMinn um, made a comment. He said something like, it's going to take a lot of time to sort this out, but let's try and do it if for no reason other than the next generation. Let's try and clean up this scams problem. Yeah, it's a huge problem. It's going to take a lot of time and effort to solve it, but let's try and do it. Even if we ourselves are not going to be particularly benefited from doing so, Let's clear it up for the next generation coming through. One of the um, consultation responses, and I think this is one of my final points before we get to Pete Glancy shortly. Uh, one of the consultation responses we submitted to the inquiry included a paper from um, Anthony Stout Stansfeld, who's the Police Crime Commissioner for Thames Valley Police, who in our eyes is an absolute hero. He's the guy that helped to prosecute the naughty bankers who were running um, all sorts of stuff they shouldn't have been doing. The, the reason I'm mentioning Anthony is because he allowed us to include in our response a paper he wrote about fraud in the UK, okay? The opening line is staggering. And the more I think about it, the more shocking it is. But this is the scale of the problem we've got. According to robust, reliable, sensible evidence, fraud costs the UK give or take a bit, as much as the NHS. Something like 2% of fraud scam cases get properly investigated. There are all sorts of systemic reasons for the way that it is. 
Some of it's about a lack of resource for the police. Some of it's about the way things fall between the cracks, shall we say, between um, City of London police and action forward. All sorts of reasons. We know all the problems. Believe me, we really do know all the problems. But my point is this. The problem is no longer tolerable. Yeah, that's why we're putting the time and effort we're into trying to make a difference. That's why we're so pleased the Working Pension Select Committee has not only picked up this problem and, and, and is, is really, really, really working hard to try to make a difference as well. Ultimately, it's all going to come down to whether we can or can't find ways to work collaboratively to join up a terribly, terribly fragmented landscape. But all of that is doable. All of that is absolutely doable. So I just want to, just before we pass over to Alexandra, who's going to mention a couple of housekeeping points, I want to thank everybody over the last three and a half, four years or so who's been with us on this journey, who, like us, have been kind of constructively banging the drum for more attention to this issue. Thank you all very, very much for being here tonight. Please put your details into the chat. Please share ideas. Please network. The more joined up we are, the more cohesive we are, the more cohesive we are, the more effective we can be. This is a massive, massive team effort. And that's what's gonna get us to where we need to go. There's already tremendous work being done by many, many stakeholders. Let's do what we can folks to join it all up. Thank you very much. I hope you can tell this is a topic that really matters to not just me, but many, many, many people within the Transparency Task Force. I don't want to keep having conversations with people who are in tears because they've lost their life savings. I don't want to keep having those conversations. I don't want to keep having conversations with people who are telling me that they know people whose kids are self-harming because their mums and dads are so stressed. I don't want to keep hearing about old people in the middle of Scotland who can't afford their heating bills because their pension fund has been nicked by some crook. Yeah, let's 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 get serious about this. Let's get seriously serious about this and let's make a difference. Alexandra, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and just dealing with a couple of housekeeping points before I then move over to introduce Peter. Thank you. Um, evening everyone, I'm Alexandra, I'm the Head of Events at TTF. Um, just to let you know that we are recording this session and we will be using some or all of the recording um, to upload on our on our YouTube channel and we might share it on social media. So if there's anything you regret saying, please send me an email and I'll make sure that we edit it out before we upload anything. Um, also obviously um, the, the chat, um, will be circulated to all the attendees in a, in a follow-up email tomorrow. But obviously we'll include any private messages that you send to me and Andy. And lastly, um, we would really appreciate it if you could help us um, just tweeting during the event. So I'll put our Twitter handle um, in the chat so you can um, help us spread the word to social media. That's okay. it for me. Thank you very much indeed, Alexandra. Please, please do that. We have no budget for promotion, advertising or anything at all. We've got no okay. money on, on anything. So please all yeah. do social media to uh, to help. Uh, spread the word, watching, okay? uh, We're now going to go straight to Pete Lancy. Pete's been an active supporter of TGF in many guises, uh, um, in, in many dimensions over the years. We're really, really pleased to have Pete's support. Uh, Pete's extremely keen on a couple of ideas that we think are absolutely superb. So we wanted to create the opportunity for Pete Glancy to uh, to share those ideas. So Pete, when you're ready to, please um, take yourself off mute and um, and share your thoughts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for inviting me along, Andy. And as you say, the TTF have been doing a, a great job on this and submitted a paper uh, um, with some ideas, you know, to the Select Committee recently. Um, there, there's there's lots of good work going on, uh, looking at different ways of tackling scams. You know, there's there's new powers. Uh, you know, going to be given to trustees, you know, to, to, to help them block transfers to schemes that they think are suspect. Um, there's lots of good ideas about better interventions, excuse me, referrals on to on pensions wise and pensions wise can perhaps help spot if uh, you know, a destination is a scam or not. But this particular idea here is looking at taking the tools of the trade away from scammers. If you remove their access to the vehicles that allow them to, to execute your trade, then you, then you could cut them, cut them off dead. So if we maybe move on to the, the next slide, please, Alexandra, that'd be great. Thank you very much. So I guess the, the starting point here would be that um, 
the, the, the government did a good job a few years back when auto enrollment came along because the scammers and the less scrupulous people and, and entities uh, around were planning on trying to intercept money that was inbound to workplace pensions by setting up master trusts that, that really weren't up to the job and run by people that, that were, 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 weren't well intentioned. And the master trust authorization regime, you know, run by the pensions regulator is a fantastic framework which filters out uh, scammers and fraudsters and their intentions and the, the less than capable. And that offers heaps and heaps of protection for people whose money is going into workplace pensions. Once the money is in workplace pensions, it's not just protected from scammers and fraudsters, but there are other protections there. There is a charge cap that applied 75 bips. There are default funds which are governed and they have to de-risk people from huge fluctuations in the stock market towards retirement. There's independent oversight from master trust boards and independent governance committees and workplace pensions have protections in place from the likes of the Protect Pensions Protection Fund and the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. So that's, that's all and well and good. But what we're starting to see is a merging of the, the workplace pensions market and the individual pensions market. And the individual pensions market was really designed for A, the self-employed who don't really use it anymore, but then mainly wealthier individuals who used to put away very large amounts of money uh, into pensions for tax break reasons, but to plan for the retirement uh, and using you know, highly qualified financial advisors. And that the types of products in the individual pensions market were, were designed, some of them, for these more sophisticated customers. And it's those types of products, and I'll come on to those in a second in a bit more detail, that are being used by the scammers as the tools of their trade. Some of those products, not all of them, uh, are being used by the scammers. And there's a huge asymmetry of information in the pensions world. You know, most pension savers don't know that their money is invested. They don't understand there's tax relief. They're not too good with you know, percentages, let alone compound interest and, you know, attitudes to risk, etc. So if you're persuaded to move your money out of a workplace pension with all of those protections, put it into an individual pension, you could be on your own. Uh, not, not, not everybody can afford a financial advisor. The charges could be much higher and they could be very opaque. So a lot of the SIP structures are very long, complicated menus of charges. And you could lose a lot of money in charges without it being legal. It's just that you can't see the effect of all of those charges. You could be working with people who are playing fast and loose with your money, uh, and you, you may be taking unacceptable risks that you don't understand, and you could lose a lot of money. Again, not illegal, it's just people playing fast and loose with, with your money. And then of course there is outright fraud, where people are just, you know, just trying to get their hands on your money and you could lose a lot. So I, I should say that there are lots of very, very good products in the individual pensions market. It does a very, very good job for a very large number of people, but there are risks. And if you're moving yourself, your money from that protected bubble uh, into the individual pensions world, you need to be aware of the scammers because this is where they tend to operate using very sophisticated SIP type vehicles. Maybe just jump onto the, the next slide, please, which is just an extension of this one. That's great, thank you. Um, it's just to, to bring this to life a bit. If you get auto enrolled at the age of 22 and the average person's in a job for you know two, three, four years in the UK, the average person will have 11 or 12 jobs by the time they retire. You've got all those protections for the first two or three or four years. And if you then move your money out of a workplace pension, it could be sitting somewhere without those protections for the next 20, 30, 35 years. You know, so it's, it's, it's very important that, uh, you know, that money stays protected, you know, all the way from the point it goes in through to the point that, that, that you retire and then through retirement. We jump on to the, the next slide. Thank you. So back in 2005, we had something called Pensions AD. And prior to Pensions AD, there were lots and lots of different types of products. And the idea here was to harmonize all the sort of terms and conditions and the tax treatments, et cetera, to just try and simplify, simplify the landscape. And at that point in time, there was a blurring between uh, simple uh, personal pension products and much more sophisticated SIP products. And everybody thought it was sexy, you know, to add as many investment options as they could to the, the, the product. And the more bells and whistles the thinking was, the more you would sell. And so what you've got in, in these types of products is you've got default or core funds. That, and a lot of these look very similar to the default funds that you would see in auto enrollment. And then you have something called open architecture, um, which is a, a wider range of, of funds which might be available from a number of pension providers and major asset managers. 
And then outside that, you have nowadays you have fund supermarkets where you can access universes of thousands of funds and stock broking where you can access individual stocks and shares. Now, all of these things carry risk, you know, the value goes up and down, but they are all legitimate investments. It's when you get beyond that into the old fashioned territory of the, of the true sips that things can get a little bit clever by far. And again, there's perfectly legitimate, sophisticated products for sophisticated investors, but it's that end of the spectrum that the scammers tend to operate, um, you know, by getting, persuading people to put their money into something, um, you know, that's either very, very risky or an outright fraud. And that's, that's I think, the bit that we need to be concerned about. Um, and the, other, the other bit I would bring out here is that, again, the, what used to be insured personal pensions and true SIPs are all kind of bundled together under the term SIPs these days, but there are quite different products in terms of the protections that are available to people. So if you went into a personal pension that was in a, a, a contract of insurance, then if someone ran off all, with all of your money, if you put a million pounds in there, the financial services compensation scheme would compensate you up to 100% of your money. So you would get your million pound back. But if you were to put it into a contract of services, which is what a lot of these products are uh, that are being used as in the more sophisticated SIP end of the market, there is no protection at the wrapper level. The individual investment that your money goes into is protected, but it's only protected up to 85,000. So if you put a million pound in there, then, then you you could you could lose over ninety percent of, of your money, you know. So it's quite important that you understand that the, the protections that are available to you. This is this is getting to the the, the, the crux of the idea here. So the idea here, uh, which which the Transparency Task Force submitted to the Select Committee as an idea, uh, in order to freeze out the scammers, we we remove the tools of their trade. So if we recognise that money going into workplace pensions is in a protective bubble. Um, we should we should look at developing a cat standard or a kite mark, whatever you want to call it, that you can award, you would award to products uh, uh, which meet certain criterion uh, into which it is suitable or permissible to transfer money from a workplace pension. And that cat standard needs to be nice and simple. We don't we don't know we need to make it war and peace and introduce loads and loads of costs and complexity. A very simple cat standard just needs to provide those same protections that you have in workplace pensions. So the cat standard govern default funds with de-risking, independent oversight, someone looking out for the consumer on your behalf, and a, a protection and compensation scheme that's, that's really really robust. There's then I think we need to have a limit on the the, the range of investments. So within that bubble, I wouldn't propose to have the really, really too clever by far type investments that the consumer doesn't understand, because that's where the scammers, you know, plant the, you know, the really complex stuff that's, that's designed out with the consumer and end up, you know, separating them from their money. But there's a question mark, I think, as to whether, you know, people who have been auto enrolled into workplace pensions and they're saving and they don't understand an awful lot about investments or investment risks, do they really need, you know, to be playing around with fund supermarkets and stockbroking? You know, so there's a debate as to, you know, how, how, how wide a range of investments would you like, uh, um, allow within that CAT standard? But it's a legitimate debate to have. And the other ingredient, which again is a debate to have, I'm not, I'm not saying one way or the other, is you, you, you could limit it to, to products uh, personal on the personal pension side, um, you know, where there, where there is full FCS you know, protection, you know, so an insurance wrapper as opposed to a contract of services. And I think the idea is there as well is that when money, if money moves from a workplace pension into a CAT standard product, one of the other criteria for that CAT standard is it can't then move on, you know, to a, a, a very sophisticated product. It can only ever move on to other workplace pensions or other individual products with that CAT standard. So the money stays protected in a bubble. It doesn't stop wealthy people who want to you know, put money directly into sophisticated SIPs and use sophisticated in uh, investments. It doesn't stop people making a conscious choice to work with a legitimate financial advisor approved by the FC in doing so. But I think the vast majority of people that are saving their money through workplace pensions uh, are not that type of sophisticated investor. Uh, and we need to stop them, protect them from being ripped off. So if, if, if the money can't get into products that, that allow the flexibility to do naughty things with people, with people's money, then, then you take away the opportunity and you effectively cut the scammers uh, out of the market. So that, that was the gist of it. Um, you know, happy to take any thoughts or any questions, uh, assuming my tech holds up. <laughs> Apologies.
Peter, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us. And I'm just going to kind of uh, briefly uh, summarise the idea for everybody's benefit, and then we'll open it up to discussion. We're very keen to get feedback on the idea. Um, in, in a nutshell, the idea is this. Um, there's already some very, very good work being done by, for example, uh, the Pension Scams Industry Group around the red flags, et cetera, which, is all, which are all about making sure that trustees of pension schemes do uh, have a strong, healthy due diligence process when a transfer is taking place. But in addition to that, what we're saying is, and what Peter's explained is, why don't we create um, a, a, a framework whereby if somebody wants to transfer from a, a, a safe environment, they're only allowed to move into some other safe environment. And you know what, what is safe? Well, that could be agreed and, and uh, debated and discussed. Uh, Pete mentioned CAT standard. The, the phrase CAT standard, I think first came about in the old stakeholder pension days. I think the CAT, if I remember rightly, uh, the C standard uh, stood for costs. So there were some criteria around costs. The A stood for access. There were some criteria around access. And the T was terms. I think the, the, the small print, the terms and conditions had to meet certain standards as well. Uh, and what Pete's basically saying is, why don't we use that kind of logic? And also the, the logic that was used when the Master Trust Assurance Framework was developed. For those of you that don't know, the Master Trust Assurance Framework was developed in the automatic enrolment pensions market because the government and regulators could see all this money going into Master Trusts and people were sat starting to say, well, what if there was a dodgy one? You know, what if there was a Master Trust that wasn't any good? What if it wasn't safe? What if it had flaws? What if it was a scam? Well, why don't we put a framework in place so that the master trust had to prove it was, you know, it was roadworthy. It had to prove it was legit. It was well designed, well funded, well backed, etc. And what Pete's basically saying is, why don't we create a similar kind of idea to basically um, mitigate the risk of people moving themselves into what turn out to be bogus, horrible, horrible arrangements that may end up being the means by which they lose their entire life savings. That's the idea in a nutshell. It's all about just erring on the side of caution, keeping with the, the spirit of pension freedoms, i.e. if you want to transfer your money, you can, but unless you've got real reasons uh, to not do so, only keep it within a safe uh, a safe environment. That, that's the logic of the idea. So we'll throw it open now for questions and comments. If anybody wants the paper, that uh, the TGF submitted to the inquiry about this topic. I think there's about 35 pages explaining it all. Uh, we'd be very happy to provide it, of course. Just pop a note saying um, paper about the idea Pete mentioned and we'll know exactly what you mean. So I'm gonna move from, um, move from uh, speaker view to gallery view so I can see everybody. We've got loads of people on the call tonight, which is wonderful. Please just wave your hand if you'd like to make a comment or, uh, or put a question to us. I can see Miss Alan Salomon has immediately done that. Alan, please uh, briefly introduce yourself and share your point. Thank you. You're on mute, Alan. There we go. Good man. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So Alan Salomon's my name. I've been in pensions, DB, DC, Master Trust, private sector always. Um, but uh, I've been around investment companies, insurance companies, pension schemes. Um, and I mean, I think the idea is quite good, but I think one of the problems that the goodies have got versus the baddies, and we're the goodies, is our communications are not effective. So I can immediately see that people would be up in arms complaining their freedoms are being cut, hardworking people can't do what they want with their money and all that sort of thing. We could get over that by some decent communication, some decent engagement. I mean, the pensions, the pensions industry is doing engagement all the time, every single day. Um, and I think it misses the point that it's not about the amount you write, because as we hear, um, People have been in schemes for 30 years or whatever, and they don't know anything about their pensions. It's just not an engaging subject, but there are ways you can communicate, short, sharp ways to tell people what the problems are. And that's the thing. We need to be, with an idea like this, we need to be on the front foot. We need to be out there talking about it. The marketing needs to be there. 
before people say, ah, but someone's promising me 10% returns a year and you're only getting one and a half. I mean, you've got to let me change it. And of course, those forests in Cambodia that he's investing in don't really exist. At least his money didn't go there. So it's a good idea, but we have to do it like we've never done things before. Yeah, I, I, I love your point, Alan. I really do love your point. Um, I, I attended a pensions regulator event today about pension scams. It was very, very good. I really enjoyed it and I picked up quite a bit. There was a point made by Margaret Snowden, which was so important. I think she said, I'm not quoting exactly, but the gist of what Margaret Sned said was, isn't it ironic that the members of pension schemes trust the scammer, who obviously by definition has done whatever it takes to build trust. The scammer has ended up being the trusted party Absolutely. and they don't trust us. We have got a serious job on our hands here to do with engagement and frankly leadership. Yeah, The yeah. pensions industry, all of us, including the regulatory framework, we've all got to do a damn sight better job than we have in the past of winning trust and support of the members and frankly leading them out of danger. It's not about taking the easy option and just, just doing whatever's easiest. You know, that, that doesn't work. We know that. We need to do what's going to work. And to my mind, if that's the equivalent of, um, you know, you know, like when you, you're teaching a kid to ride a bicycle, you've got those little stabilizers. You know, Pete's idea is basically saying, look, if you don't really know how to ride your bike yet, let's get some stabilizers on it just to make sure you don't go, you know, losing your front teeth. That's basically the idea. Now, thanks for your point, Alan. That's great. Um, I think Mr. Mark Bishop would like to uh, make a point as well. Mark, can you please unmute yourself and go for it? I have to ask everybody to be as short and sweet because we've got lots of people here and I want to make sure that we get as much covered tonight as you possibly can. Mark Bishop, please go for it. Thank you. OK, thank you. I think uh, this is a tempting idea, but it has ex executional challenges. Uh, I don't think it's possible to place the obligation to limit a transfer into a CAT product to the, the transferring out pension scheme trustees, because they're either transferring out um, in specie or more often cash. Cash is fine. That's CAT you know, compliant. The question is what happens once it goes into the SIP? If it's a low cost SIP, like we've got AJ Bell, somebody from AJ Bell is on this call, that's fine. They can only invest in, you know, recognised unit trusts and, you know, investment trusts and individual stocks. The problem comes when it's one of the complex SIPs where it can go into other types of assets. The obligation has to be on the provider of that SIP. But the problem is if the provider of that SIP is either negligent or dishonest, then this cap marking thing is not going to stop them. If they want to transfer it to you know, rainforests in Ecuador because their mate runs the scheme and they're getting a 25% cashback, they're still going to do it. Um, yeah. Of course, you, know, you can create a law that says you're not allowed to do it and you can hope that the FCA kind of finds some you know, cojones and then starts prosecuting people who do these things. But you know, we could ask for that to happen now anyway. Um, so I don't know whether the CAT standard itself solves the problem myself. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your input. A balanced view as always. We've got time for one more quick uh, comment question before we move on. Um, Francesca, lovely to see you as always, joining us all the way from uh, uh, Vienna. Uh, Francesca, as short and sweet as you can, please. Thank you. I will make it short. I just want to say that Margaret Snowden in the pension thing very wittily said that the pension industry should learn from the scammers how to communicate. It's interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting point. Thank you very much. OK, I'll go back to Pete Lancia now just to share any final comments he'd like to make before we wrap up and uh, show our appreciation to Pete for his session. Uh, Pete, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think I would just agree with that final point. Um, the, the, the idea here is it would become a, 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 a legal requirement, you know, on, on pension providers, insurers and trustees you know, that they can only transfer the money, you know, to a destination which has the kite, kite mark or the CAT standard. That's the only way that, we, that it would work. I know that the government at the moment is trying to give, you know, trustees more more powers in that regard. The difficult thing is, is when that those powers are subjective, because at the moment, you know, the, the customer could be irate. They've built up a lot of trust with the de destination uh, product. Deadline. Oh, and um, missed the deadline for that, that, Oxbridge. Uh, Somebody's oh, internal. Yeah, I was going to say it hasn't yeah, passed. Yeah. Oh, All right. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, if it's if it's not if it's not the um, if it's not if it's not if it's not written into the, the the law, you're going to get a whole bunch of arguments with trustees about you know it's a very subjective judgment and why why are you allowing that? Um, you know, so if there's a legal requirement that you can only transfer the money to a permitted destination that has the qualifying product, that's that's when you would cut out the scammers. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. OK, in the interest of managing our time tonight, we're going to move on very, very swiftly. Before we do, we'll show our appreciation to Pete for his session. Thank you very much indeed. Remember, folks, if you want that paper, you're very welcome to have it. We put a lot of work into it. Pete very much led the way with that, with his idea. Please do wave and, and show appreciation to Peter for his session. Thank you very much indeed. And while we're doing that, we're going to invite Leslie Carline to unmute herself and uh, take care of us for the next 10 minutes or so. For those of you that don't know, uh, Leslie, like Peter, is a stalwart of the pensions industry until very recently, president, I think I'm right in saying, of the Pensions Management Institute. Um, I'm just going to quickly stop you sharing, Leslie, because I didn't turn to the speaker view. Um, so, Leslie, if you don't mind, please uh, share your screen once again. Unmute yourself if you haven't already and uh, share with us your thoughts over the next 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know me, because looking at you all, I'm from a slightly different part of the industry, although there are two or three friendly faces that I recognise, notably Margaret and Alan. Um, I have spent 20, 29 years in the industry working for third party administrators, pension software providers and investment houses. And about eight and a half years ago, I crossed the divide and became a consultant working at KGC Associates, a small independent pensions management consultancy. And we are probably best known for our third party evaluation work and our annual surveys of admin providers and actual service providers. But what we do um, as an organisation is operational governance. So as you can imagine, it means that we speak to most players in the supply chain that are delivering retirement savings to members. And before I move on, um, I think Alan took a bit of a wind out myself by, by pointing out the fact that it's really quite sad that Joe Bloggs listens to his mate down at the pub before he'll listen to a pensions expert. Why is that? So, shall we start? Um, COVID-19, March 2020, headlines, lockdown will lead to more pension scams. Um, as you mentioned, I was president of the PMI and I chaired the Policy and Public Affairs Committee. And we take a biannual survey, um, the pulse of our members. So we thought we would ask the membership had they seen an increase in pension scams activity? And it was really surprising, and I think it was because it was May, they'd only seen, 12% had only seen a slight increase, and 67% said that they had not seen any increase at all. I think if we did the survey and asked the same question now, it might be different. But what they had said that overall, they felt that financial scams were on the increase um, and that we should be aware of anything and everything. And something that's come out from our part of the industry is this concern about post-retirement scams. And I suppose it's picking up on what Pete was saying earlier. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know whether you're a Pete or a Peter, but you were saying once you were outside our, our our protection as an industry who looks after you and I don't know if any of you have seen the consumer affairs program on BBC on a morning with Julia Somerville, Gloria Honeyford and Angela Rippon and quite often I mean I don't watch it often but when I've been on invariably there is somebody who has taken their pension they've got a pot of money and they've been hit by the scammers and some of the scams are not just forests, but also diamonds. And, and there was just gentlemen. He had spent thousands investing in diamonds and he probably got a, a couple of hundred pounds worth of diamonds back. So um, Action Fraud report that 30 million pounds has been lost in pensions since 2017. And I'm sure when Margaret um, takes over after me, she'll probably frighten you with some even more scary numbers about what is happening. So who are the victims? The victims, well, 
it could be you, it could be me. Scammers are very clever and intelligent people and they always seem to be one step ahead. And a compliance chappy I know from an EBC, an employee benefit consultancy, sorry if I'm using jargon, said that we won't stop scammers. All we can hope to do is limit the damage that they do, which is really quite sad. Now, the pensions regulator is about to issue a survey to administrators of pension schemes, whether they're a third party administrator or an in-house run one. And they do actually have a section on how people are supporting vulnerable people, because it is the vulnerable that are the bread and butter of scammers, the elderly. And one of the things that lockdown has done, particularly for those who are borderline dementia, it stopped the process of being, being people being diagnosed. So they are stuck in limbo and nobody is looking after them. And they are prey. There's also loneliness and in lockdown loneliness isn't just the, um, the grey haired retired person. It is a lot of people and people are dying for human contact. Well, should I say desperate? Dying isn't quite the right word in today's incidents, but are desperate for some human contact, even if it is at the expense of their savings. And what is even going to what is going to get worse during lockdown is people's financial hardship. The stories we've seen, they're in terrible financial straits, and they are desperately vulnerable to scammers who are offering them a solution. And I read an article or report recently where um, they found on the, and this is on the trust base side, that 60% of those that had been warned that it might be a scam or in not in their best interests had still gone ahead with a transfer. So it is disheartening that this is all going on. So moving on, yes, that is a photograph of Donald and Boris. And I'm using them to illustrate something. Now, have any of you sat there and listened to Boris and wondered what the hell is he going on about when he goes into his archaic language and starts referring to Greek classics that Joe blogs, and I include myself in this, do not have the foggiest what he's talking about. He uses overly complex language. And it made me think about pensions people and when pensions people are talking to members about their retirement options, just something smacks quite similar. We use very complicated words and we're, we're hamstrung by regulation about what we can and we can't say. Now, Donald, surprise, surprise, is representing the scammer. And if you listen to him, he used, sign, he used sound bites. He says what you want to hear. He used short sentences. He used simple words. I mean, you may think the guy's a plonker, but he's very effective. But so is your scammer. They research you. They're friendly. They're approachable. It always seems to be quite timely when they contact you. They use simple words. They, they don't use jargon. They might use one or two jargon words just to make it sound sort of official. But what they're really offering you is a problem solving solution. They're offering you money when you need it. And what's making it even worse is this whole ESG thing. And the scammers are appealing to your social conscience. Yes, we've mentioned forests, but they also have some renewable energy plant in some third world country that will benefit from your investment. See how easy it is to be taken in by this friendly, and, and as we referred to, um, Margaret saying, the scammers are your best friends when it really should be the pensions experts. So tackling this, I mean, first off, one of the things I would like to see sorted out is this guidance versus advice issue once and for all. I did some work with the FCA. They've been tackling the culture of the financial services industry via purpose. It's the sort of second stage in the, the work they've been carrying out. And one of the things I did was I had to get together 10 of the CEOs of different parts of the industry 
And then we're all very happy with the fact that the purpose of the industry is to deliver good member outcomes. But we also had to look at the barriers that were preventing people from delivering good member outcomes. And they all agreed to a man that it was guidance versus advice. EBC is frightened to, to overstep a mark and inadvertently going into advice. One CEO said, yes, we could buy a wealth management arm. We could buy an IFA, but we're too scared of retrospective legal action. So something has to be done about it. The second, training. Training the frontline administrators and in EBCs in the call centres. I mean, the PMI, and I'm always going to push the PMI, they came out with a certificate in pension scheme member guidance, and it coincided with um, pensions freedoms. And it actually teaches administrators how to speak to that member who is coming up to and going through retirement without going into that advice area. And then third, and this is a, a real soapbox moment for me, is can we sort out some common pensions language that we can use both internally and externally? Now, KGC has advised organisations who members have worked in the contract-based world and want to work in the trust-based world. And the first thing we have to do to them is teach them our trust-based language. Contributions instead of premiums benefits instead of claims. That's really, really simplistic. And there's much more complicated things that I could go into. But I was in a meeting and I was talking about flipping a single trust into a master trust. Now, some people in the room knew what I was saying because they were from the same part of the industry as me. But there was a DCIO guy there, a defined contribution investment only platform provider, who hadn't got Scoobies, what I was saying. So it just shows we as an industry don't understand each other when we're talking. So how is Joe Public supposed to understand us? And we have an opportunity coming up with, firstly, with simplified benefit statements, and then secondly, with the pensions dashboard to try and work together to create a universally recognized pensions language. It sounds like an impossible task, but I think we should actually try and do something about it. And then another bugbear, and I know there's some IFAs on the line, but the pensions industry does not trust IFAs. Um, there was an EBC and I actually saw the lady from that EBC and she pointed these statistics out to me. Their research found that if an IFA is doing advice on transfers, they will recommend that 60% go through, yet their wealth management arm reckons it should only be 20%. Now, this distrust of, ISA, of IFAs has gone back decades, you know, pensions mis-selling. Um, we thought that things like RDR would sort it out, um, but it's not helped when you have um, things like the British Steel and Port Tabel incidents. Yes, there was fraudsters, but yes, there was also bad IFAs. And then you also get the FCA stating that some transfer advice wasn't quite appropriate. So what we really, really need is to get the FCA to work with the IFAs to get their house in order. But we also need the other side of the industry, the EBCs, to start building bridges with their counterparts. Because why there are these gaps? Because one side doesn't want to talk to each other. You are leaving gaps for scammers to get through. And with that, um, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Leslie. That was great. Um, all the slides will be circulated, so you'll be able to um, connect with Leslie through her contact details on the slides if you'd like to do so. Uh, we'll throw it straight open to uh, questions and comments from the from the group. So once again, just please wave your hand at me if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Um, preferably somebody we haven't heard from before. Would anybody like to make a point at this stage? We'll go to Francisca first, then we'll go to Mark Bishop. Francisca, short and sweet for me, please. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to make it very short and sweet. Um, 
I feel that there has been a huge improvement with tax communications and government communications and government websites. 30 years ago, nobody could understand anything and now people can. There has been an excellent, good English, plain English campaign and I feel, you know, it has been done in different areas. Thank you, that's a really interesting point. Um, if anybody knows who within HMRC may have been involved in the work HMRC has been doing about simple English, straightforward English, then it would be good to know because I think there is a great idea in terms of lessons learned. Uh, Mark Bishop, I think you put your hand up again. Is that right? No, you didn't. In which case, I will just see if anybody else has anything they'd like to share at this point. Alan Salomon, go for it, Alan. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, I just wanted to mention the point of advice that Leslie rightly brought up. Too big a subject to go in here, but the issue of advice as the FCA have made it and as the leaders of major companies have interpreted it has done enormous damage to the industry and to people's interest and understanding of it. Um, you can hardly use the word advice before and that's the advice to save instead of gamble. Um, you can hardly use it in the industry without people jumping up and down. And ordinary people aren't getting the guidance um, and the interest given to them about financial issues that they should have because they want advice and they don't understand regulated financial advice is something completely different. But unfortunately, nor does the industry. So that is a big area that has caused us enormous problems and probably has led to a lot of the scamming and the, the lack of trust by the nation. Thank you very much indeed. OK, um, time for one more if there is one, otherwise we'll move swiftly on. Let's move swiftly on. Of course, we'll start off by thanking Leslie for her presentation. Please do show your appreciation. Thank you very, very much indeed. Super stuff. Um, I think Bryn Walker might have been asking to make a point then. Bryn, did I see you late? No, I didn't. Okay, we're now going to go straight to Margaret Snowden. For some of you like me, this will be the second time we've heard Margaret today. She always talks so much sense. It's always worth listening to. Uh, Margaret, please unmute yourself and over to you to share your points. If you can keep it within the 10 minutes, that would be super. And after that, we're going to take a short comfort break before we move on to our two parliamentarians. Margaret, over to you. Thank you for being with us. Okay. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, it's been a bit of a long day, so if I uh, sort of nod off, um, just give me a prod. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, don't do, it's not coming up for some reason. It's all working good here. Oh, there we go. Looks as though it's, uh, it's working. Um, I thought I would um, take a slightly different tack. Um, I, I can actually give you some scary numbers, um, you know, given the appeal by Leslie uh, to do so. Um, in terms of numbers, we, we, we've seen, um, you know, the figures that we see officially, um, which are scary enough. Um, but in reality, if you look at the incidents that we see of scamming, um, the numbers are likely to be far, far higher. Um, and, and we think the number of people who are scammed and, and obviously various different degrees of scams, some lose everything, um, some lose less than everything, but um, it's about 10,000 people a year being scammed. Um, we see about 200, and this year I think it was 300 um, reported. Um, there's, a, there's a huge big um, gap there. So we reckon if you build the numbers, based on the, the likely scams, about £10 billion has gone out of pension schemes into scammers' pockets um, since 2015. Now that's scary. It's scary because there's still more than two trillion to go. And if we don't do something, um, you know, they're likely to get their hands on substantially more. But, um, but 10 billion is actually 10% of the annual um, state scheme spend. So if, if, if we had 10% of people losing their pensions, there would be a hue and cry. But um, because it's private pensions, it's a little bit hidden. Um, it's taken a long time to raise some real interest in this area. It's too easy for scammers. Um, as I was arguing earlier on today, 
um, there are very few barriers. But I thought I would concentrate a little bit on what PSIG is actually doing. So if I just can pull this on to slideshow, it might, it might actually work, which would be good. There we go. Right. So um, quick canter um, through what PSIG has been doing. Now, PSIG is a voluntary group. Um, we, we're often asked who is our um, chief executive, who is my secretary, who is you know, our analyst, all of those kind of things. Well, actually, we don't really have any of those. We just have a bunch of people from different parts of the industry who got together in 2014, um, recognizing that scams were growing as a problem. Um, so we, we set up in 2014 um, and what we did was we wrote a code because we thought we need people at the seeding end, in other words, trustees, we need them to help people not lose their money. So we um, produced a code which uh, in 2015, which set out how to spot scams basically, um, and gave some other tools. And we're now on to version 2.2 um, because things keep changing, scams keep changing their patterns. Um, so we're now, we're now writing 2.2. Um, and because it's got to something like 170 pages now, we are rewriting the shape of it so that it's easier to follow. Um, and that's due to come out in February next year. An important thing we also did was we set up a, an information sharing forum. Um, and that's one of the best things we've done. Um, and the chair is in the audience, um, Tommy Burns, um, and he deserves a lot of credit for, you know, setting this up. Um, and, and what it is, it's um, about 50 pretty big companies um, in the UK get around a network and talk about scams that they have seen come across their desks. Now, they can't publish that externally, which is one of the problems we always face, but they can share it among themselves. Um, and it does mean that, you know, if, if a, a name comes up, someday another company can look out for it. Um, so it does contribute a lot um, to safety. We tried very hard to get a change through the pension schemes bill because one of the great ironies is that um, trustees and providers can look at a proposed transfer, they can know that it's likely, very highly likely to be a scam and they can do nothing about it because there's a very strong legal guard in the statutory right to transfer. So people are actually able to transfer to a scam. So, um, so we argued for a change to this to give trustees the power to refuse um, dodgy transfers. And we had cross-party agreement to it, um, but for various reasons, the amendment was um, voted down. There was a conservative majority in the House um, and they voted um, against it. But <clears throat> what we did manage to do was we managed to get um, the pensions minister to agree to introduce regulations that would actually have the same effect. It's not written in the face of the bill, but by April um, next, next year, we should have a set of um, red flags that um, are written in regulation that if they're seen on a transfer, the transfer doesn't have a statutory right and can therefore be legitimately refused. Um, so we're working with the DWP now to draft those red and what will be amber flags um, as well for the less serious um, problems. Um, so again, you know, hopefully that will come through in April, but it's, it's a huge step, an absolutely huge um, step. Um, we work alongside Project Bloom um, because we needed Bloom to deliver things. Um, so so we are there as the, the known um, legislative um, solution deliverer um, and we push Bloom as hard as we can um, to do some joined up things with other agencies because there, there are too many um, different organisations all doing different things and sometimes treading over one another's toes. We also um, proposed a change to the Finance Act um, to stop the ludicrous practice of HMRC 
automatically um, charging tax penalties on victims. Um, I think it's one of the worst things. Um, they, they also um, charge tax on schemes that have been used for a scam. So not only do the, the individual victims um, have to pay tax, but the schemes that took the money in the first place also have to pay tax. Um, so it's, it's a bit daft. So we, we, um, we've been fighting for a number of um, you know months, um, well, actually, technically since 2018, to stop that practice. Um, but um, I even wrote to uh, um, the Chancellor, who's very good at giving away money at the moment, but um, he didn't even deign to reply to me um, when I was asking for 40 million. Um, we gave written and oral evidence to the Working Pensions Committee, being very open about solutions, open about the problem. Um, and I'm very pleased to say I've been, was working very closely with the chair um, on his arguments for the Commons debates. Um, and he did very well, but he was up against it. Um, and we've um, just today launched a scams pledge with the pensions regulator that Andy mentioned. Um, and that really was to try and give some welly to the code. Um, because it's very easy for people to say it's a voluntary code, we don't need to do it, we don't want to spend any money. Um, you know, the, the regulator coming behind that, um, I think will help make a, a bit of a difference. So moving on, we have further plans. Um, despite the fact we have no money, um, we're looking to try and, um, and grow a little bit more, do some more things that are important for the industry. Um, so we're setting up as a community interest company, um, not for profit, um, and we will be looking for some funding. Um, signs don't look too promising, but we'll see how that goes. Um, money's a bit tight these days. Um, I mentioned already um, the scams code, but um, we're also um, working with the pensions regulator and the NEC um, to develop a central intelligence hub. Um, we're pushing them very hard to do this. There's a reluctance to share, um, particularly enforcement information, because it can jeopardise cases. Now, we get that, but when cases take four years you know, to come through, the scammers are well able to keep going and keep taking money off more and more innocent people. Um, so our um, informal um, sessions will probably continue, but we would like to see a lot more sharing um, coming out from the authorities. Um, so that's a, a very important piece of work we're doing. We're also going to be launching an accreditation scheme. Um, now that's a scheme where um, either a pension scheme or a provider can um, sign up um, and be audited to show that they are actually protecting members from potential scams. So it's, it's all preventative work rather than follow up after the event, but we believe very strongly that you have to um, stop them before they happen because afterwards it's way too late. Um, now, we, we did have a concern that um, what happens if a scammer um, comes along and tries to be um, certified? Um, well, that's why we're having it independently audited um, so that we can stop that. And we're also working at the moment on MI, um, management information on scams, um, because we're fed up um, having to say, no, no, you're wrong. There are multiples of those um, sort of cases out there. We need to be able to prove it. And the only way we can do that is actually by collecting um, MI. Um, and it will be national um, and the pensions regulator will, will be standing behind it, which is, which is good. Um, and the final thing um, for, for next year um, is trying to improve the reporting. If you've ever tried to report a scam through action fraud, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and you do always get the sense that they're not terribly interested, but they don't necessarily join the dots um, so that you can have a number of cases being reported. But because they go to different police forces, um, you know, it looks like only one in Cumbria and one in 
East Ayrshire or something. So it doesn't look like a national picture. Um, so we're trying to improve that reporting. We're doing it through Bloom um, so that we can get all of the agencies to listen um, and to work together. But um, if, if we get those things through, um, what we think we'll be able to do is prevent a lot of people being um, cheated. Um, now I know it's not great comfort for ones who already have been, but if we don't um, take actions, we'll end up with the next 10 billion going to scammers and generally they're overseas, so it doesn't even do anything for our economy. That's all I was going to say. I'm happy to take um, questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Margaret. That was great. Yeah, you've covered a lot of ground in just uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. We'll go straight to comments and questions from the floor and um, we'll then be having a short break. So uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to share at this point? If not, I'm going to jump in with something myself. Uh, Margaret, you very kindly talked about HMRC. I'm going to share with um, everybody my view. Uh, my view is that HMRC has dropped the ball big time on a number of fronts. And I'd, I'd welcome Margaret's comment on this. F first of all, HMRC very incorrectly reduced the governance and due diligence around the process that was being used when people were setting up pension entities. Uh, they used to have a reasonably tight, robust governance framework with a bit of due diligence. For reasons we still don't really understand, they went from that to a framework which was online that was easy peasy to get through. We believe this happened shortly after Pension Freedoms, which made it all a scammer's paradise. It would basically mean that anybody could go and set up a pension vehicle that could then be used as the basis of pension scamming. Uh, we also understand that HMRC, when they realized the mistake they made after a few years, went back to a previous reasonably high level of due diligence and governance. But for several years, the floodgates were open for all sorts of dodgy characters to go setting up dodgy pension schemes. And they took that opportunity. So we think HMRC made a mistake. Uh, they've obviously been rather reluctant to admit that, but all the evidence is there that there was a reasonably high due diligence framework. It was replaced by something online, which made it very, very easy for dodgy characters to set up pension schemes. Despite that, despite that, even when it is obvious and even when there is stacks of evidence that the person made a transfer because they were being conned by a professional criminal, if you understand my use of the phrase professional criminal, a, a trained capable <coughs> con artist, <coughs> despite the fact that the person made the transfer because they were under the influence of the misinformation given by a crook, HMRC are still going after these people for tax of up to, well, very, very high levels of tax. So I'm making a statement here. I think we've got members of the press here, including the Daily Mail. I say HMRC are profiting from the process of crime. I'm going to repeat it. HMRC are profiting from the proceeds of crime. That in and of itself is a breach of HMRC's Citizens Charter, because if you read and study that, it's full of all the right kind of language about treating people proportionally and respectfully. And we believe HMRC is unnecessarily hiding behind tax law to enable them to continue to profit from the process of crime. And we will keep banging on about this until what we believe to be justice is hopefully one day sorted out. It is wrong. It is, a, it is a morally indefensible position that somebody can not only lose their life savings because they were duped by a trickster, they then have the risk of being made bankrupt or homes taken away from them and all that stuff as a consequence of HMRC profiting from the proceeds of crime when the scammer may well have become a scammer as a result of HMRC failing 
to apply basic levels of due diligence when the vehicle that became the scan vehicle was set up. This is atrocious. It's a national scandal. It needs to be sorted out. It really does need to be sorted out. Margaret's an incredibly capable lady and even Margaret Snowden has not been able to get HMRC to listen to reason and this needs to stop. Margaret, I think I'm right in saying that HMRC's defence, if that's the right word, is that they are saying they simply have to apply tax law. Is that the gist of it, Margaret? Uh, that's, that's correct. Um, it's very clear that um, you know, people who transferred money out of an occupational pension scheme where they got tax relief um, on those contributions, um, they transfer it to another scheme and take money out early. They have broken you know, regulations. So, I mean, that is a fact. They have done that. Um, there is no defence that they were conned into doing it. Um, that's why you know, I'm trying very hard to get the law changed because when the law was drafted, um, we didn't, nobody foresaw the professional scammer. Um, what they, they saw were people trying to avoid tax um, and they were trying to stop that practice. Now, those people were usually people who were being tax advised. They were usually very wealthy people and they were trying to pull a fast one. Um, but we moved on to a different um, type of, you know, taking money out of a pension scheme and it's it's... It's bad practice, it's sharp practice to have done that, but um, we need the law change to give discretion. Now, discretion doesn't necessarily mean the HMRC will be sympathetic. Um, they might not apply discretion, but at the moment they do not have discretion um, and it's, it's impossible for them to take a different view. Um, so as I say, we need to change the law. Um, and it's, uh, uh, the suggested um, change to the law is very, very easy. It's one line going into one clause in Pench uh, Finance Act 2004. Um, it's been round the houses. You know, I'm terribly disappointed that it hasn't been picked up because it would be a wonderful Christmas present for you know the chancellor to say that he's sympathetic um, to all these people but but watch this space i don't i don't ever give up you certainly don't margaret which is one of the many reasons why i and many others are very very much in admiration of the work that you've been doing for many years in this space i, I know how much time you personally have been putting into all this over a long period of time we'll throw it open to comments and questions particularly does anybody have any comment or question in relation to HMRC point, I'll repeat the phrase again, hope it catches on. Andy Agathangelo says HMRC are profiting from the proceeds of crime. What say you folks? Does anybody like to comment on that? Dan's waving his hands. To make matters worse, not only, not only are they profiting from proceeds of crime, not only are, are, have some people become scammers as a consequence of HMRC's failure to apply decent due diligence to be registered, uh, to, 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 make it, to make it even worse, they simply do not deal with paint and scam victims in anything like a humane and civilised way. They seem to be completely and utterly um, detached from the harsh reality that many of these people are in a state of long-term emotional and financial shock. It really is a scandal. Um, any other quick comments before we say thank you to Margaret? Okay, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it there. So, Margaret, thank you very much indeed for your session. Much appreciated. Let's show our appreciation to Margaret. It's 22 minutes past. We've got time for a three-minute, literally just a three-minute comfort break, and then we'll go straight to Nigel Mills MP for his thoughts. So thank you all very much indeed. We're covering a lot of ground. Please be back in, um, in literally in three minutes' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll briefly explain the rest of the running order. We've got uh, Nigel Mills MP. Nigel, as I mentioned earlier, is a very uh, important member of the Work and Pension Select Committee. Uh, we've then got uh, some one minute rounds. Uh, for those of you that don't know, our one minute rounds are inspired, if that's the right word, by Radio 4's um, Just a Minute. So the idea is just to spend a minute sharing your key points. Uh, the order we've got for those is as follows. 
Peter O'Donnell, then Leslie Kerwin, then Mark Bishop, then Ian Beeston, then Mr. Henry Tapper, then Gareth Roberts. And hopefully that will leave us a little bit of time after that for general Q&A, um, chit chat, discussion, etc. Uh, we'll be passing over to Nigel in about a minute or two. But just before we do, I will explain the Transparency Task Force strategy for driving change. Uh, we do have one. We have a strategy for driving change. Uh, and the reason we have a strategy for driving change is because there's no point doing what we do if it doesn't actually make a difference. So making change actually happen is at the very epicenter of the very reason for having the Transparency Task Force. So how do we do that? Well, our strategy for driving change is very simple, but it's proven to be quite effective already. It's about bringing together the thinking of two types of people. On one hand, there are those that we characterize as having a sense of passion and purpose for the change that we want to see. Tonight, for example, you've heard from Margaret Snowden, you've heard from Pete Glancy, you've heard from Leslie, passionate about the change that we want to see. And the other group of people are those that we characterize as having the power and the position to make change possible. And who do we mean by that? Well, we mean the policymakers, um, parliamentarians, regulators, leaders of the major trade bodies. And what the Transparency Task Force does in various different ways is create opportunities to bring the thinking of those two groups together with hopefully the idea that some of the ideas and input and momentum and passion from those with a sense of change needed uh, will become absorbed by those who um, those who actually are able to implement change and of course therefore we actively seek ways to uh, to do this that's why i guess we've tried hard to help create the all-party parliamentary group for pension scams for which we're the secretariat that's why we've tried hard to help create the all-party parliamentary group on personal banking and fairer financial services for which we're also the secretariat uh, that's why we've campaigned to get two inquiries opened. Most recently, the one on pension scams, which we uh, we, we we worked hard to try to get um, opened. And previously, a few years ago, there was one on um, on pension cost transparency, which again the Work and Pension Subcommittee picked up and did a did a did a marvelous job. So the events that we run and the work that we do isn't just about running things for the sake of it. They're all part of a strategic methodology for making change happen and this is very very important and the reason it's very important is because something like 90 percent of responses to consultations comes from industry we are very much in the minority the transparency task force is all about speaking up for the consumer the ordinary member of the public and we know that it's very hard to get that voice listened to properly which is why we do all we possibly can to make sure that their cause, their, their, um, uh, you know, their importance is properly listened to. We have what we call a North Star question, and we apply this North Star question whenever we're thinking about how to respond to a situation or, for example, how to respond to a consultation. And that North Star question is very simple. It is, what's best for the consumer? And we honestly believe, we honestly believe that if everybody in the industry just focus on the question, what's best for the consumer, or more specifically in this context, what's best for this pension scheme member, uh, not only will we have a happy, a happy public, but we'll also have a very profitable industry. And let me just dwell on, just before I pass over to Nigel, uh, let me focus attention on something really important. And some of you have seen this before. I don't make apologies about it because I think it's so important. What we're looking at right now, folks, is violation tracker violation tracker is a u.s database it isn't in the uk properly yet but we're working on that we've got a big project on the go to bring violation tracker to the uk several times today including margaret in the earlier session with the pensions regulator spoke about the harsh reality that the public don't trust the industry and it's there's no real surprise i'll, I'll, I'll tell you what i mean if we go to this database what you're looking at, folks, is a list of the worst offending industries. OK, this is in the United States of America, but I'm pretty confident the, the, the general profile will be similar to what we have here in the UK. The financial services sector is the least obedient sector. 
$325 billion, not million, $325 billion worth of fines, 5,976 cases. The next worst offending industry is oil and gas, 45 billion. That's a hell of a lot. But the finance industry is seven times worse than the oil and gas industry in terms of infringements. But it's worse than that. Let me show you what I mean by that. If you then go into the next level of detail, you'll have the worst offending companies. As it happens, Bank of America is the worst offending bank in the United States of America. Uh, it's not something I'm proud of at all. I'm sure you're not either. But if you look at the organization here, the Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Deutsche Bank, UBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, yeah, RBS, $13.45 billion worth of fines. And if you then go to this list where it gives the individual cases, what you'll see, ladies and gentlemen, is recidivism. Recidivism is the word to describe when somebody or something does something wrong, gets penalized for it, but carries on doing it. The financial services sector is becoming increasingly distrusted because it carries on doing its bad stuff. The same organizations coming up time and time again doing the same things. And many people within our community believe this is evidence, hard evidence, that they see the risk of being caught doing something wrong as simply a cost of doing business. And if that's the case, it's a terrible problem to try to sort out. So distrust of the system is a huge issue. And frankly, we know that one of the buttons the scammers press when they are talking to pension scheme members is, do you trust the employer? You might have noticed, Henry made a great point in the chat earlier. He said that when the topic of, um, when the, topic of um, the pension scams in British Steel came about, the scammers knew that the members of the British Steel organization did not trust British Steel. They knew how to use that distrust as a weapon to convince people to move into somewhere that they were, that they pretended was gonna be safer. So distrust of the system is a huge systemic issue and it's exactly the kind of thing that pinch and scams uh, makes it even worse. So I hope that uh, sets the scene for whatever it is Nigel would like to now share with us. Nigel, if I can invite you please to Take yourself off mute if you haven't already done so, and please do share with us your thoughts. Uh, we're very grateful, Nigel, that you're with us. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. Andy, thank you for the invite and the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've listened to most of the events, so I'm, I'm following on from people who um, know far more about this whole uh, issue than I would ever claim to. It must be worth giving a, perhaps a few thoughts on the select committee inquiry that you've talked about obviously the, the inquiry is ongoing so i i can't prejudge what our findings would be uh but uh, other speakers have mentioned the you know the, the cross-party work that was taking place in relation to the pension schemes bill that was in parliament over over recent weeks and some of the measures we were we were trying to make progress on in, in, in terms of how we thought we could help tackle pension scams and the the first area was the one that um, Margaret was heavily involved in uh, around trying to give um, trustees the ability, the discretion not to go ahead with transfers if you know, there are clear hallmarks of a scam. And it, you know, it just seems slightly bizarre to everybody that uh, you know, the, the kind of people who should be protecting their members' interests can see something that they think is dodgy and yet they're obliged by law basically to go ahead and, and make a transfer in those situations now i think we could probably all accept that it's people's own money and if they really really want to do something then they should probably be allowed to do it but there have to be some some limits and nobody really really wants to have that money stolen or be scammed so they, 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 they would have to find a compromise which just says actually if this really does look like a very dubious place to transfer to that that transfer can be refused or at the very least it can be slowed down while further work takes place and i think for some of the evidence that i've seen from 
not just pension scams, but other scams, the one of the tricks the scammers pull is to create a sense of urgency. You know, this is a limited time opportunity. You really do need to crack on with this now. And they'll tell you you can't have your money that quickly. And they tell you you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. But, you know, you really must insist. And if we could just at least find a way of putting a month's delay or something into that process if someone has time to talk to their family or take proper advice or just think again that might even be a real sense of progress so uh, it's, it's very welcome that the government did although it didn't accept the amendment that was tabled they've agreed to try and achieve the same thing through through regulations and we'll watch with interest what the final drafting of of that um, text is but i and I think it was Peter earlier had a, you know, I thought some quite sensible recommendations for how we could um, go further than that. And really, if we're talking about people with, you know, not huge amounts of money, the chances of them wanting to invest in Cambodian forest futures or something are really quite slim. Uh, so you think in those situations, we could just say, actually, there are some things you just can't transfer out of a pension pot to. Yes, we accept if you've got millions of pounds and you've taken proper financial advice that you might wish to do that but actually unadvised people with relatively small amounts of money we should have some restrictions in place the um this, the second group well, this, this, the second theme of amendments we tried to push were to try and increase the take up of the uk's pension wise service uh, which is a free guidance service for people uh, who are over the age of 55 that they can go and get not advice that they can get some information to assist them in understanding the pension world and what their options are and what they might be thinking of doing and there are many of us who would who think that actually unless you've taken independent advice this high quality free guidance service should be as near compulsory as we could as we could make it and actually people shouldn't be accessing the money they've spent 40 years of hard work saving without being absolutely sure they understand what they need to do and that's not just so they won't be scammed but so that you know they don't run out of money too soon in their retirement or they don't you know, end up scrimping and being miserable for a retirement and actually end up dying with more money left than they thought they were going to have so that there's all those very good reasons why people need to understand what their options are at that point and that, that service is free. It gets hugely positive feedback and has take up of about 3% of people. It's just scandalous, really, that we haven't managed to get a, a higher take up. So that is, I, I think if we could just at least build that in. So if someone rings up their pension scheme and says, I want to access my money, they should say, have you had your free pension wise guidance session? And if they say no, they say, we can't have your money in it. Do you have that pension wise session? Go away and have it. Bring back the reference to say you've done it and then you can progress with that transfer and that would seem to me to be a perfectly reasonable thing to build in it's not going to cost them any money it shouldn't take that amount of time it's not a, a painful experience in any, any sort of way and that way we've got at least a chance of intervening so if someone had that call and said well i'm thinking of transferring into this very aggressive or slightly dodgy sounding thing at least the person doing that guidance could say wait a minute that doesn't sound like a normal form of investment are you absolutely sure you understand that and know what you uh, really are going to end up yeah you know, I, I think that would be a line of defense we could have but yeah you know, it's a system that's already there it's underused we should try and build it up uh, so, so those were the two things we were trying to push I think, I think there's further work to do on getting that that guidance take up the government have chosen to go with a nudge to try and give people a, yeah, a, bit, a bit more advice that it exists and a further incentive I, I think we'll have to watch very carefully if they can get the take up up anywhere near the levels we'd like it to be this probably is a key role for the pension industry there to be saying to all their members actually yes go away and take this guidance even though there's even though hopefully that guidance will lead to much more shopping around before people buy products rather than staying with their incumbent provider but i think overall to improve the reputation of the industry and get the better outcomes we all want to see and more people understand what on earth this all means and what's going on i think will be hugely positive because we know that most people you know vast majority of people are, are not ripped off by their pensions they may not get the outcome they want but that's not due to anything deliberately going wrong on the on the, on the part of the industry people just don't understand how, how this all works they can't understand how they've saved for 40 years and then their savings lose value and that statement they get they, they think it's all a bit dodgier than it really is the more we can do to build up people's confidence in the industry actually the better for the industry and the, and the better for members as well so those were 
the rough themes of uh, the uh, select committee's work on the patient schemes bill we've got the inquiry going on on scams i think we'll be reaching the end of that relatively soon but there are two further pieces of work uh, to come one of which i'm particularly keen on is is to look at the journey people have when they reach their retirement age and choose what to do with their hard safe money it's not one that has the same level of regulations as the accumulation stage when you're saving there aren't charge caps in that situation there has been some welcome progress on default pathways so people have perhaps some you know, some sensible choices but not the full range that they can actually understand more easily uh, so hopefully we can make some, some progress there make that part of the journey safer and cheaper for people as well so they, so they aren't tricked into making mistakes but Andy with that I'm happy to take any questions people have for a bit. Nigel thank you very much indeed for um, setting out your thoughts there I watched um, I watched um, the pensions bill on parliament tv on catch up and um, I think I'm right in saying the take up of the uh, free advice is something like 11%. That, that number is sort of lodged in my mind, which is very low. And that was after quite a bit of effort. It's, so It's 3%, Andy, but on a trial regulator did with some of the larger pension schemes, they managed to get it up to 14% using the nudge. Uh, so, so even with the very best schemes and the very best of the trial of the, the new approach, we managed to get uh, one in seven people to take it up. Now, there's, there's no need for 100% because people are in very different situations. That number should be overwhelmingly higher than 14%. It's pretty, really, pretty terrible. I, I, I absolutely agree. I'm sure everybody in this call does. Um, it's, it's an obvious thing to do, isn't it? It really is an obvious thing to try to do. So good luck with that. May I just ask a quick question, with, obviously without mentioning anything specific. Um, as, as a parliamentarian, do you get members of the public in your constituency writing to you about pension scams? Is, is it an issue that comes up with, with you and your and the people in, in your, in your constitu constituency, Nigel? Yes, I... I think all MPs do get casework on scams of various description. I, I don't recall a pension scam case in the last ten years, but there have been a lot of cases I may have I, I may have not remembered completely. So uh, I don't I don't remember one, but I've certainly seen people who've sadly been victim to a whole load of different scams uh, and the challenges of how to get your money back if at all, even if at times you know, you know where it's gone, you still can't get it. So I, I think there's a great deal of more work needed to touch on our law enforcement and our processes for trying to help people who yeah, for no real fault of their own fallen victim to some pretty plausible and evil people who who do these things uh, but you know the, the various pensions issues do come up all the time around complexity and not being the outcome people want but i don't recall a scam at least not for a long time interesting um, one of the things that comes up time and time again when somebody's realised they've been scammed is that they don't know where to turn to for support and uh, they often find themselves being you know passed from one party to another um, that's certainly an area that could be improved thank you very much Nigel we'll go to our audience and see if anybody would like to either put an idea or a question or a comment to you Nigel uh, Alan Salomon very quick on the uptake and then we'll go to Bryn Walker uh, thanks Alan Thank you very much. I'm sorry to keep asking questions, but it's so interesting. Um, I wanted to ask Nigel, um, have you thought about the, the sort of smartphone ability to communicate with people? Because 80% of the population apparently has smartphones. A lot more people than probably are interested in their pensions or even perhaps even with auto enrollment have pensions. But um, through smartphones, through the new um, ways of communicating in personal financial management tools and uh, um, various websites that will help you with your money or even sell you products. But you can overlay a requirement that these firms do have an element of education and help about scams and how to solve scams and how to get in touch with the right people. And it can be made really attractive and on your phone you can sort of gamify it so actually people can be entertained by using these sort of things but that's the way forward and that and people are engaged with their phones as you can see every moment when you walk around but is have is that an aspect i think it is an aspect and it's, it's important for the industry to work on i mean where i would perhaps have the strongest views will be around the pensions dashboard which 
hopefully we'll see at some point in the future you know that, that dashboard where you can go on and see all your pensions across various different pots and you know hopefully be able to see your state pension you know, and hopefully you'll have information on there about you know, how much you really ought to have saved by now and you know what you can do to try and close that that gap and I, I've always believed that the problem we have with pensions is a lack of people understanding and engaging with it and we and the only way to fix that is for people to have the information at their fingertips in whatever financial apps they use, whether that's their, their banking app or whatever else is out there. So they can actually see what they've got and get more of an understanding of what they've got and what it means. I think if we can get that increased engagement and understanding, it makes it harder for someone to scam you into doing something quite aggressive that you don't really want to do. If you actually do understand the situation, you've been saving it and you've got a plan for what you'll do when you get there. So I, I think all that way of boosting engagement and having links to whatever advice and guidance you could find there would be really useful. I would be slightly nervous in some situations. If I go on my banking app and make a payment, it takes me through a load of scam warnings and that, that's obviously very sensible. But the thing with pensions is there really is no need to rush in any situation. You've been saving it for, for decades. It's gonna be funding your retirement, hopefully for, for many, many years there's no need to do an impulse transaction that actually yes you should be informed yes that advice should all be there but yeah i wouldn't want to see people actually be able to do very much at the click of a button i'd rather it would be a much slower process so we can make sure that they are making the right decision in that situation so i i wouldn't want to see that two-way version of the dashboard where you can start doing transactions and moving pensions around i, I think that would be incredibly risky and open to abuse so i would be quite resistant to to that sort of functionality from your from your smartphone after a few beers on a Friday night or something. Well, thanks, Nigel. A great point, Alan, and a very positive response as well. Let's go back to our next uh, our next uh, questioner. Um, where is the gentleman? We saw him. Bryn, he's moved on my screen. Bryn, you haven't yet spoken, so please introduce yourself, Bryn, then go to make your point. Thank you. And I think we're then going to go back to Mark Bishop. Bryn, over to you. You'll need to unmute yourself, please, first, Bryn. There we go. Good man. Hi, my name's Bryn Walker. I think I'm quite at the sharp end of this, being a, a pension trustee. Um, I think I come across scams uh, every week. I have numerous points to make, and I, I, I'll i need more time than I have. My first question to Nigel was the very sensible suggestion of making it compulsory for people coming up to retirement to, to, to visit pension was was voted down which I found, found insane. And I just wonder if you're gonna keep bringing it back up and like, like the Scottish do with devolution until it's actually voted yes, because it's the most sensible solution I've heard. That's my first question. Do, do I carry on or does Nigel get to I, I, answer that? So yes, we'll keep pushing on that. I mean, the, the, if you ever watch these parliamentary debates, it's quite hard as, as bad bench members to actually table amendments which really work so you kind of want to raise an issue and get the government to agree and if the government agree then things can be done properly so yes absolutely the, the efforts to increase the uptake of guidance will continue the government have got a strategy the um, regulator to achieve that i'm a bit skeptical whether you can ever encourage people enough to do something and i think we found with auto enrollment you should have an opt-out system so we should be really saying your, here's your appointment for pension wise if you really don't want it then you can bring up and cancel it uh but perhaps people actually making their own appointment i think is is quite hard because people don't understand what they don't understand so if you don't know that you don't know something you're not going to go and seek out information on it so i think we'll have to we'll have to keep going but the actual models if you, harness, just, if, you totally, harness, if you harness the smartphone suggestion previously with your suggestion of of opting out I think you'd get a much higher take up. I mean, people don't want to go and visit somebody to have an appointment, especially during COVID, but probably after. But here's a Zoom appointment on a smartphone. Yeah, most of it's done by phone anyway. So that, that's I think, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant idea. Okay, let's go to your next point then, please, Bryn. I think you had another one? Yeah, well, I've numerous ones, but I won't bring them all up. So, I mean, as a pension trustee, so, so our, our company uh, operates small self-administered schemes which is where an awful lot of these scams uh, did take place. Um, Andy, I, I mean, I've, I've dealt with, I think, four million pounds worth of, of client scams myself. And your previous point that you made about HMRC being compliant is absolutely true. 90% um, of that, that four million pound was done through small self-administered schemes. Um, and nobody had a professional trustee. 
it's not a requirement for a small self-administered scheme, and I run them, to, to have a pension trustee, which seems in, insane. Now, I get um, what I consider to be scam investments come across uh, my desk every week from, from uh, members who I am the professional trustee for. Um, and going back to a point that was made earlier in terms of they don't have to make an instant decision, um, I quite happily say, I think this is a scam and I'm not going to countersign your check. It, it, it's that simple. Now that stops it dead. If they want to do it, I say, go and find another trustee because I've seen this before. I've done this for 30 years. And yes, the, the 50% you're going to get every month sounds really, really attractive on top of your old age pension, but you'll lose your money in a month and then you'll hold me responsible. So I'm not prepared for that. So I'm not going to sign in your check. And that really just stopped things in its tracks. Now, why can't that provision be widened to other trustees or make it simply a requirement that every pension has to have a, a, a professional pension trustee involved? Because we know what would, in the main, we know what a scam looks like. That, that's my point finished. Thank you, Brent. We're going to go. We're going to go to Mark Bishop for his point, and we'll <coughs> back to Nigel for his final comments before we move on. Uh, Mark Bishop, your point, please. Thank you. Okay, I've actually got uh, about three small, quick points to follow up on what uh, Nigel said. The first one is uh, you said you, you you weren't sure whether you'd seen any pension scams in the last ten years. It may be that we and you are using different definitions of pension scam. Um, we tend to use one that says it's any money from a pension, even if it's now outside of the pension. So if, for example, you've received casework about London Capital and Finance, uh, Connaught, Lendy, Funding Secure, Part First, <clears throat> a lot of that money is money that people have withdrawn from pensions and they've invested in the way that they believe will get them an income now, but it doesn't. And the one of the reasons why scammers like that money is that anybody has an absolute right once they reach the age of normally 55 to withdraw cash from their pension and once it's out of there and it's in their bank account you know there are no checks and balances at all that's the first point the second point you talked about pension wise and you wanted to make it more available and perhaps even make it mandatory under certain circumstances i absolutely agree with you um, I would also say I think that it should be made available people to people, perhaps even made mandatory at certain key decision making points before the age of 50, which is currently the minimum age at which it's available. I tried to make use of it for something for myself when I was 48. They said, terribly sorry, we can't help you because you're not 50. I had to use the Age Discrimination Act to get them to give me a free consultation. Very few people would have pushed that. Um, when people in decide to invest in some madcap scheme like, you know, forestry futures, they may be 25, they might be 40. You know, they're, they're a long way from the age at which Pension Wise currently is interested in talking to them, let alone them having to talk to Pension Wise or to turn down a Pension Wise discussion uh, before doing this investment. Uh, thirdly, and I think this is the final point, you talked about a journey. And I think your idea of investment as a journey is probably the most important one. I think it's absolutely critical, it's central to this. Um, and uh, I'm currently writing, I uh, drafted a consultation uh, for uh, Transparency Task Force for the FCA's um, consultation about uh, consumer investment schemes. And in that, I talk about the journey idea. And I, I raise the idea that when there are key decisions to be made, people either need physical advice or they need to maybe get advice online whereby they complete some kind of course that shows that they're competent. You know, if you talk about a journey from A to B on the road system, you'd need a driving license to do it. A provisional driving license lets you drive supervised. A car driving license, you can drive a car. If you want to drive a truck or a you know, bus or something, you need a different type of license and training, don't you? Why don't we take some of that approach to people's finances. You know, there are life-changing errors that are made by people who've had no training, no qualifications whatsoever, which I think is probably quite wrong. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Uh, great points. Uh, Nigel, if I can please pass back to you to make any final comments you wish to before we move on to the first of our one minute rounds. Uh, Nigel. Yeah, I'll thank I'll you. a couple of those, I guess. Um, as the first one is, you know, the Money and Pensions Service offers financial advice in different areas in addition to carrying out the telephone pension-wise stuff. So hopefully on, my, on some of those instances that question's talking about, they, they, different parts of their service could provide some, some guidance in those situations. I am... Um, I think where I do agree with the minister is he's very keen on a midlife financial MOT where people, presumably somewhere between 45 and 50, could have a have a session you know, which updates them on their saving position and what they need to do and what their aspirations are for their retirement and what their what their gap is. So 
to say yes, I, I think I would broadly agree with that, that we, you shouldn't be limited to being at retirement. But I, I still think probably the main use for me for pension wise is when people are about to access their pension pot for them to have a, you know, a session so they understand what they're going to do, what their options are, how long they might live and how they're going to fund the whole of that time. So I, yeah, I, I guess while pension wise isn't being very highly used, let's get people to have more than one session over various parts of their uh, well, to retirement but I guess I think where I would envisage that having the most use is at that point where you're about to start accessing the money you've been saving for all those years I think it's probably where it can have the most beneficial impact I wouldn't mind that being six months before or a year before or something I'm just slightly nervous that if you tell me something at the age of 55 that I'll remember it when I'm 68 uh yeah I just think people just wouldn't want advice at 55 about what they might do 13 years later and if they did the world would have moved on or they'll have had a few sleeps and forgotten it all uh so i think you need it at that key decision point at, at that point okay andy nigel. great to have been here see you again thank you very much indeed nigel thank you for your input can we please show our appreciation to nigel mills mp for his contributions today and spending some of his time with us that's great nigel thank you very very much indeed super stuff we're going to go straight to the first of our one minute rounders to uh, who i know is going to try very hard despite the fact that he's an australian i know he's going to say to keep it within one minute peter o'donnell over to you sir as succinctly as you possibly can peter thank you very much and after peter just to let you know the running order we go peter o'donnell leslie Kerwin, mark bishop ian beeston henry tapper gareth roberts and then we'll be closing roughly five past maybe ten past the hour uh, peter over to you thank you uh, last uh, Friday, uh, an email was sent email. to what called the, the Dolphin German Property Group Action Group on Facebook, uh, referring them to us for advice on uh, what routes they have to uh, get their money back. Uh, Dolphin uh, Trust uh, took in 1.6 billion euros from over 6,000 investors of which Britain and Ireland might probably made up 40%. Uh, we had a response of over 300 people contacted us and I've been phoning uh, these people to get their details uh, so they can be included in a, a, an action, legal action group. And I've had people who invested between 25 and 750,000 pounds. The 750,000 pounds person was a doctor who said, my biggest problem is I don't know how to tell my wife uh, he's retired. Uh, but I also had one today that said he, he, he was with Scottish Widows. Uh, an IFA recommended he put his money into Dolphin. He transferred his occupational pension scheme from Scottish Widows into a SIP administered by James Hay. Uh, and then he put £25,000 into the scheme and the scheme blew up uh, mid this year uh, and is an insolvency in Germany. Uh, the driving force for this is is secret commissions. And I really would love the, uh, the politicians to look into the payment of secret commissions uh, of between 20 and 50% as really a crime. For someone, if someone's recommending an investment, you're getting so much money, uh, there really should be a way of identifying and stopping that. I finished. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for being so succinct as well. I think it's just mathematical facts, but if you go above a certain sort of threshold in terms of commission, it's virtually, you know, it's un implausible that you've actually bought into an investment that's going to give you a decent return. I think you make a very, very good point, Peter. Thank you for sharing it. Let's now go to Leslie Kerwin. Lovely to have you with us as always, Leslie. Please feel free now to make your point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, as a, a broadcast journalist who's talked to a lot of um, victims of, of scams in, in the past, um, I was really interested to hear about some of the solutions and particularly about the possibility of a CAT standard, a kite mark for um, suitable products for individual investors. I thought that was really exciting. Um, I think it would have to be a legal requirement because having you know, over so many years seen things that were voluntary, you know, that never really works, it would have to be a requirement. I thought that was that was fascinating. And Leslie Carline talking about um, a universally recognised pensions language. Now that really struck a chord with me because I have to say one of the, the things that people do not understand the language that the financial industry uses about pensions. And so it's not just a language that the industry can understand every side of it. It's also about a language that members 
can understand. And uh, Margaret Snowden talking about how maybe by April trustees might under some circumstances be able to refuse dodgy transfers, what a huge step that would be. And of course, we've all heard about the HMRC um, levying tax on victims, which is unforgivable, frankly. Um, now, at one point, Leslie said, why does Joe Bloggs trust the mate down the pub rather than the pension experts? And as Andy said, and as we keep hearing, it's about a lack of the trust in the financial industry. There's almost a folk memory of all those mis-selling scandals that I have reported on over 30, 35 years. It is in, people know all this. Unfortunately, there's a huge way to go before we can disprove that. And, and at the moment, we can't disprove it. You know, people don't even trust their employers like British Steel, as, as uh, Henry was saying. So it's, it's about the language. I feel so strongly about this. The language has to be simpler language. Nigel Mills was talking about a journey. And my worry is that not only do people not even understand what kind of pension they've got, so many people have said to me, I don't know what sort of pension it is. Will you have a look at the documents for me? It's, it's extraordinary. What, what they really don't understand is the decumulation. And that's the problem. That's why people are being um, persuaded by simple language that they understand into something that is completely wrong. That's it for me. Leslie, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Such a clear, clear, clear message. Uh, I think the points we made a few times tonight, the, the decumulation stage is pretty much still like the Wild West, isn't it? There the, the really isn't the... Uh, the, the framework of protections there for us. Thank you so much, Leslie. Always really lovely to have you with us. We're going to go to Mark Bishop. Mark, I'm going to invite you to be as succinct as you possibly can uh, to you. Then after Mark, we've got Ian Beeston, if he's still with us, then Henry and then Gareth. Mark Bishop. Thank you. I think Leslie made a, a really important point, which is that your average consumer has a folk memory of all of the financial services scandals that has happened in which there was some element of financially regulated, you know, advice or promotion involved. Um, and, you know, against the background of, you know, people whose money has been locked up in, I don't know, Woodford for the last couple of years, and they're going to get back perhaps, you know, a third of what they put in, you know, if your mate down the pub says they know about something very exciting, actually, it could be as good as Woodford, or it could be better. You know, that, that's the difficult truth that we're up against. And therefore, you know, I have to mention the elephant in the room, which is, you know, broadly speaking, the FCA is spectacularly unfit for purpose. And until you fix that, you're not going to fix any of the problems that we've been talking about today. Um, I think that, the, that, you know, the other thing is, you know, we talk a lot about rules, you know, cat stones. Cat stones would be a great idea, you know, if, of course, the, the people who run, you know, corporate trust um, pension schemes, those trustees, are, are decent and honourable, it's quite well regulated, but it's the people who run the receiving funds that are the problem, or the receiving SIPs that are the problem, and until you can make regulation actually apply to those existing rules, apply to those people, then you know you can't trust what they will do once the money is in there as cash. Um, I think that you know, in the absence of effective financial services regulation, the only other thing you can do is to empower consumers. I touched on this a bit when I was responding to what uh, Nigel Mills was talking about, and I just want to clarify what I had in mind there, which is, you know, that, for example, you know, if a scammer goes after, you know, relatively affluent self-employed person at the age of 40 who's got, you know, 400, 500k in their SIP and says, why not put 100k of this into a Brazilian rainforest? At the moment, the only thing that will stop that person from getting away with it is the consumer knowing that this is a bad idea. And there are two ways that can happen. The first is that you can require them to get advice before the money can be physically allocated. The second way, which is even better, because it means that the you know, requirement can't be avoided, is to require them to go on an online course before they open their SIP. They explain stuff like this, and they may even have to fill in some questions to like a little online test to prove that they actually understand it. Um, and that, I think, is, is the kind of guerrilla response to what we have uh, in this market at the, market, at the moment. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. You just made a perfect segue into Miss Ian Beeston when you made reference to the idea of online education. Ian, please introduce yourself, make your point, and uh, feel free to talk to people about the product your organisation has. I think it's great, and I'm very keen for you to help people make become aware of what it is and what it does. Uh, over to you, Ian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that intro, Andy. My name is Ian Beeston. I'm a co-founder of Money Alive. Um, I mentioned in the chat that one of our customers described us today 
as the Netflix of pensions education, which was which was quite an original take on what we do. But essentially what we do is uh, we've developed some interactive educational video box sets on a range of pension topics. And our video engagement platform is licensed by trustees and advisors and EBCs now to educate scheme members on things like pension transfers and pension freedoms choices. We also have developed video email and we're working with actually PSIG at the moment on an idea about putting a single video within an email about pension scams that could be sent to everybody by their trustee or their administrator or provider at their point of vulnerability, which is basically when they ask for a pension transfer or when they wish to make a substantial withdrawal from their pension. One minute, thank you. Ian, that's fantastic. Don't, don't hesitate Ian, to put a link to your product services in the chat. Um, I think I think got some superb ideas there. Mr. Henry Tucker, you're next. Over to you, Henry. Thanks, Andy. Uh, hi, everyone. My point in one minute is that most of what we've been talking about today has been preventative, has involved locking down information and stopping people getting uh, into a mess by making it difficult for them to do things. Um, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing if what they're about to do is stupid. However, 99% of the things that people do in financial services aren't stupid, they make good decisions. And we have got a problem if we continue to use scamming as a reason not to get people information in their hands at the time when they need it, because the, 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 the blunt proof is that if people are denied information, which they need to take decisions, they will go round the corner and find it in another way. And that is very often leading them into the hands of scammers. So we must be very careful not to allow the scamming argument to get in the way of things like free information available, whether it's on dashboards or in any other um, way. Yeah, uh, And uh, my only concern with what Nigel was saying was when he mentioned that people might start taking decisions after they left the pub after having had a few pints. Frankly, that's not what people do with pensions. They are generally very considered. And we notice, you know, that most of the people, most of the time, are bloody sensible. So let's not allow scams to get in the way of good in terms of new innovation and good practice. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. Um, and last of our one minute rounds is Mr. Gareth Roberts, who, uh, like everybody else, is going to be responding to the question, how would you fix the pension scams problem? Uh, Gareth, if it was down to you to sort the whole thing out, what would you do? Well, it's very much picking up, uh, up on what Mark said about the regulators being fit for purpose. Uh, my hands-on experience with the regulators in a sort of two and a half year investigation of the pension trustee was very disappointing. Uh, it was their lack of appetite to pursue the perpetrators of these scams. I personally spoon fed them the audit trail of the commissions that were spoken about from the unregulated world into the hands of IFAs, SIP providers and DFM. They had the evidence in front of them and there was no willingness whatsoever to pursue these, um, these individuals to the point whereby these individuals were phoenixing. This is how people have come out of British Steel pension schemes and have ended up owning Dolphin that was referred to, TRG, and many other inappropriate um, investments. I think we have to have a regulator that is fit for purpose and get angry when people lose their money. There is no anger in our regulator. Gareth, you make a very strong point very, very well. Thank you for sharing your thoughts so freely and so openly. Um, okay, folks, I'm going to make a couple of points before we bring things to a close. Um, before I forget to mention, if anybody that's on this session tonight wants to attend tomorrow's event, you can on a complimentary basis. Please remember what I said earlier about our new subscription mo model. We have a very good event tomorrow. Um, uh, Steve Keane, Professor Steve Keane, talking about covid and the case for a private debt jubilee it's all about the build back better notion 
We've also got Michael Hudson, who's one of the one of the world's most famous economists, also speaking alongside Professor Steve Keen. And we've got some very, very other interesting folks as well. Completely different subject to tonight, of course, but again, on the basic theme of making the world a better place. I'm going to bring things to a close now. I want to thank all everybody for participating tonight, uh, not just in the session itself, but people like Margaret uh, and many others who've been doing all sorts of work on a voluntary basis to try to get on top of this pension scams problem. It really is a great big issue. We need to carry on getting the media involved. We need to carry on asking the parliamentarians to do what they can do. They really are doing a hell of a lot at the minute through the pensions bill, through the pensions inquiry and beyond that as well. Um, the financial services sector really does need to sort itself out and that's only going to happen if enough of us keep kicking up about the things it doesn't quite get right as constructively as possible, not just pointing out the problems but also offering pragmatic solutions as well. So um, unless anybody has any that are particularly keen to uh, share, um, we'll wrap the session up there. Can okay. I just say one thing, and that is that on Thursday lunchtime, Radio 4, you and yours, is doing a, an hour-long programme on uh, the dolphin situation, Peter, uh, oh. and it's going to be quite good, I expect, because, I, you know, they had a chat with me about it. Sounds like they're going down the right route. That's really good to know. Thank you very much, Nick Henry. Henry, do me a favour. Would you mind popping that into the chat so when we circulate the notes tomorrow, uh, people can be aware? So Thursdays, you and yours. Is that what you're saying? Oh, Thursday, what you and yours, one o'clock. Okay, lovely. I will definitely be. Well, thank, you. thank you very much, Henry. Okay, I'm going to keep the channel open it's just in case anybody wants to have a kind of fireside chat dialogue amongst friends, as it were. <clears throat> we'll do that for sort of 10, 15 minutes or so. But in terms of formally bring the session to a close. That's what we're going to do now. Thank you all very, very much indeed for your attendance and participation and all the work that's going on behind the scenes by many, many people. Thanks, folks.